I was startled here recently when I saw something that came up on my Facebook. It was like an ad or something. You know, you see all that stuff coming up. And uh, it, it actually startled me when I saw what it said. And so I did a little research to find out where did this come from. And this uh, statistic came from the um, Barna Research Group. And it talked about, it, the statistics from the research says that half of churchgoers, half of churchgoers have never heard of the Great Commission. And I saw this morning from a Facebook feed that this week is called the Missions Week. Well, I would hope that, you know, all of you are churchgoers, so would it be correct to say that half of you this morning haven't heard of the Great Commission? That actually startled me. And when it talks about the millennials, which I would assume that most people here outside of, of staff and Dr. Marbury, we would fit basically in the same uh, generation, but uh, you would be called millennials, and it says that only about 10% of millennials have heard of the Great Commission. That does, that startles me, particularly when we're talking about the church of Jesus Christ. The churches, 51% of church goers have not heard of the Great Commission or what it stands for. That's not my message this morning, but it's a startling fact, and because this is declared the Missions Week, I wanted to bring that to your attention. And why is it so important to me is because when we look into the Scripture, the very last words that the Scripture records of Jesus speaking to His disciples, the very last words... That's what we coin, the terminology is coined, the Great Commission. It's the commission that Christ has given to the church, that he gave to his disciples, and it's for us today. The very last words, and then today, 51% of church growers never heard of it. Or maybe they've never heard of this, this terminology. But then when you start putting down a lot of verses and say, which one of these are the, represent the Great Commission, that also is a challenge. So then, I think it's very important that we understand this. And uh, I think what I would say, you know, I'm going to be speaking today, and uh, if I get a good note from Dr. Marbury, then I'll be speaking on Thursday. This is Missions Week. We have two days. I'm a recruiter. I'm a recruiter for the Great Commission. However, my recruitment probably this morning and Thursday will most likely not entice a lot of people to join. I probably would fall somewhat into the same category of recruitment of, of uh, John Weaver, you know, where, where he's been and some of the places that he goes where we could call it dangerous, right? And so what I want to speak on this morning, actually, uh, let me just set the stage straight here. It's kind of crooked. Um, the thoughts that I'd like to share with you this morning, I shared them at the Free Will Baptist Convention in Little Rock in July. So the only people that I give the right to snooze a little bit 
are those that might have heard me before. But if you do, please be kind enough not to snore. All right? That's the only ones. So if you have a student sitting next to you that might be sleeping, just nudge them and wake them up. As I was talking to the band earlier, the worship crew, I said when I was in the classroom, when I was a professor in Africa and one of my students would fall asleep, I would throw something at them. But I don't think that's kosher in the United States today. It was when I was growing up, but I probably can't do that today. All I have is a bottle of water, and my finger is hurt. And this is very serious because it's my pointing finger. But I discovered one of the best ways to learn a foreign language is to have a 150-pound quarter-inch piece of steel fall on your finger. And you begin, and you can learn a foreign language pretty quickly. Well, some of you, it just went whoop right over your head. So what I would like to share with you over the next few moments, and I hope my watch doesn't stop. I was telling Alex that I was talking to a college group in California last month, and uh, the, the host family gave me so much time, and I like to respect that. And I kept looking at my watch, and I said, I'm doing good, I'm doing good. And then finally I, I finished, and uh, then the host said, you know, you're just like all preachers. You know, you went way over. I said, what are you talking about? Look what time it is. And my watch had stopped. So, but he said he would cue me in if I go over. The theme that I would like to develop this morning and on Thursday is something that the American church shies away from. The American leadership, Christian leadership, shies away from, and we don't speak of it very often, and it is called to suffer. We are called to suffer, and we don't like to suffer. When we get on the ball court and the coach is there and he makes you run sprints after sprints, then, you know, it, it, you can kind of suffer a little bit. I know what I'm talking about. I was on the ball team here when I was a student, and we were one of the best in shape teams in the conference. We didn't win very many games. But we were the, one of the best in shape because we suffered physically. But the Christians, the Scripture tells us that we are called to suffer. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. We should follow in his steps. There's a tendency to think that suffering was for them. That suffering was for those people that Peter was writing about. The Holy Spirit directed him to write these words. And so we're talking about them. And often, you know, we'll read this verse of Scripture and we'll say, yeah, you know, we could Christ suffer. We're, we're called to suffer. We're called to walk in his steps. But we don't very often really grasp the magnitude or the significance of this and understand the, the real meaning here that Christ suffered and we're called to follow in his steps. 
We're called to follow His example. So who are some of them that perhaps we might be thinking that the Scripture was talking about? Well, do you, you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? I hope you do. One of the famous stories in the Scripture. You know, they were thrown into the furnace because they were followers of God. And they would not deny Him for anything. Even when it meant suffering. So they were thrown into the furnace for their faith. God didn't put out the fire. He put Jesus in there with them. And they came out without smoke. It's not about God stopping all the things that look bad. It's about who is in there with you. And then there was Daniel and Esther, and and the list goes on about them who were called to suffer. What about the 12 apostles? Those that Jesus trained and he worked with for over three years. Those who followed Jesus and understood that his command was for all followers of himself, of Jesus. Do you remember what happened to them? The 12 apostles, Andrew, a follower of Christ. He was crucified. Bartholomew, he was beaten and then crucified. James, son of Alphas, stoned to death. James, son of Zebedee, beheaded. John was boiled in oil, but when that failed, he was exiled for his faith, and he died of old age. Judas, not Iscariot, he was stoned to death. Matthew, he was speared to death. Peter was crucified upside down. The very one that penned the words of this scripture this morning. Philip was crucified. Simon, crucified. Thomas, speared to death. Matthias, stoned to death. This is the them we're talking about. But why do you think that these disciples, these followers of Jesus, were willing to suffer such terrible persecution? Why would that be so? Do you suppose that it's because they had seen him crucified and then rise from the dead and knowing that the truth was worth dying for? I'd like for us to back up just a few verses of Scripture from 1 Peter 2.21. So that we can get the full thought, the full concept here. Because if we just pick out one verse and isolate it, we might think that it is just for them. Remember when Peter began to pen the epistle, he was writing to the followers of Jesus throughout the known world. I believe that it is relevant for us this morning. That he was also writing for us. In verse 9 he says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of of him who called you out of darkness into this, his wonderful light. And then he's speaking to the same audience in verse 20. He says, how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So then, to whom is the Scripture speaking to? I believe wholeheartedly that the Scripture is speaking to us, to you, and to me. And we cannot escape the truth of the Scripture. 
So if this is so, why do we see leadership in our churches, leadership in our homes, leadership in our Christian schools and colleges throughout the United States, why do we see them try by all means to avoid this principle, to avoid suffering? One of the most frequent questions I get asked as I travel from coast to coast in the United States is this. How dangerous is it? Is it safe? I present a question to you. What if God meant what he said when he said it? What if God really meant what he said when he said it? In Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So when we read this, for all of my life when I read this, I said, oh, wow. You know, God knew him when he was in his mother's womb, and he had a plan for him. He set him apart. So that must be the case for me. God has a plan, and he has a plan for each one of us this morning. Everyone that's here, God has a special plan for you. Before you breathe your first breath, God knew you when you were just a speck, microscopic dot. God knew you. He formed you. In Jeremiah, after much suffering, God spoke to his people after they had been taken into exile and suffered greatly. He had a plan. God knows what he's doing. Sometimes in life, as life moves along, we have a tendency to question that. Do you really know what you're doing? Do you really know what's happening to me, God? Why are you allowing this? God has a plan. He knows what he's doing. And this is what he told the people. In Jeremiah 29, 10, and 11, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Plans to give you hope and a future. So why, please tell me why, would we want to thwart God's plans or his thoughts towards us? Why would we want to interfere in God's calling in the lives of high school students, in the lives of college students, in the lives of young married people, middle-aged and senior adults? Why would we want to thwart that when they feel like God is calling them to exactly what the Great Commission is all about? To go. And as we say, to go to the regions beyond, to go into some of the hardest places on the earth. Why would we want to thwart that? Is it because we don't deem it safe? As I told you, one of the most frequent questions I get asked, is it safe or how dangerous is it? What does that matter? Let's stop insulting God with safe living. When I was 15 years old, without any decision of my own, I found myself in Africa, deep into the jungles of 
Ivory Coast. It was no choice of my own. But I guarantee you, it was God's choice. God would take me to Africa as a 15-year-old boy to expose me firsthand to the perils of living in Africa. It was the year 1969, 49 years ago, this past July. At the age of 16, while home on break from boarding school, I told my mother, if I ever get out of Africa, I'll never return. But oh, God has his plans for us. And what did he do? God went straight to work on my heart. And that is one of the neat things that I love about God. He can take a hard heart and he can break it. He can pierce it. And that's what he did to me. He went straight to work on my heart, turning my heart of utter frustration and discontent towards a loving God who sent his son to die, and yes, to die for the African people too. At the age of 18, when I was desperately seeking God's plan for my life, he brought me across the hymn entitled, We've a Story to Tell to the Nations. That song, the words of this song, spoke directly to my heart as an 18-year-old young man. And some of the words are, we've a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right. We've a message to give to the nations that the Lord who reigneth above has sent us his Son to save us and show us that God is love. We've a Savior to show to the nations who the path of sorrow has trod, that all of the world's great peoples might come to the truth of God. And that's when it all began. Forty-six years later, at the age of 18, walking one night in the outskirts of a little village where we live deep into the bush country, the jungle country, in a little village called Nassion. There was no electricity, no lights that night except for the splendor of God in the starry host. It was just the stars shining and blinking. It was an awesome sight. Very seldom do we in America anymore get to see that because there's so much light everywhere. But there I was that night walking down the little dirt path asking God specifically to speak to my heart. <clears throat> if you seek Him with all of your heart, you will find Him. And I found Him that night. I was a believer. I was a Christian. And now I was seeking him. What do you want me to do? What path do you want me to follow for my life? And he said very clearly to my spirit, come follow me, prepare yourself, and return to this land. To the very country two years earlier, I had desperately wanted out. God's thoughts, his plans were so much different than what I thought I had wanted. I didn't understand at this time in my life 
that we were called to suffer. Or maybe I should state I didn't understand the depth of it. But God would later in my life give me the privilege of entering into the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Elizabeth Elliot, who was a former missionary to South America, she made this statement. The result of my obedience is God's business. Let that sink in. The result of my obedience is God's business. For you see, we are called to suffer. And suffering comes in many different levels and degrees. But it is not our business to try to stay safe. It is our business to be obedient and leave the results to God. And that is the call to stop. So I will continue on Thursday. It was not because of that phone that went off. So don't feel too terribly bad. But if you do it on Thursday, I will get mad. But let me just conclude once more with this statement that Elizabeth Elliot made. The result of my obedience is God's business. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for who you are. And I pray for each person in this auditorium this morning, that you would reveal yourself to them in a fresh and new way, that you would give us a greater understanding of who you are and what you require of us for all that you have done for us. We pray this in your name. 